This is Reason Revolution. I am your host, Justin Clark. Thank you for joining us this week. I have a very special episode for you tonight. Actually, it's going to end up being two. I had a very wide-ranging and interesting conversation with my first guest on Reason Revolution. Every month, I intend to have one episode of the podcast called The Interview, where I bring someone on from the atheist, secular, and free thought movements to share their perspectives and how they relate to the topics that we discuss on this show. I was very fortunate to have a, ver- a wonderful first guest in Justin Scott, who is the director of Eastern Iowa Atheists. I'm going to read you his little bio now. Often referred to as the Iowa Atheists, today's guest has been a pain in the side for theocrats and religionists across Iowa for the past two years, challenging mayors to adopt more constitutionally sound prayer practices at city council meetings and demanding that atheists get to take part in the process, demanding equality and inclusion for atheists at the Iowa State Capitol by delivering the state's first ever atheist invocation and challenging presidential candidates during the 2016 presidential election. This activism led him to create the Eastern Iowa Atheists, an advocacy group of atheists that fight for total separation of church and state, or as he calls it, religion and government, where he leads nearly 500 members across a 30 plus county area. We are thrilled to have atheist activist, leader, husband, father of three, and full-time professional photographer, Justin Scott. And without further ado, let's start part one of my interview with Justin Scott. Justin Scott, how are you good, sir? Doing well, yourself? I am fine. I am fine. I am so glad to have you here on Reason Revolution. You are the first guest You were the first interview of my new podcast, so thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to come and talk to me. Um, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, The best part about being the first one is that I get to set the bar, and I'm not going to set it very high. (laughs) So then the the second and third guests should just leap right over it. (laughs) No, no, I like to think maybe you'll set the template and people will go, you know, I got to live up to those standards, you know, Um, (laughs) you know. Um, but, uh, so basically I'm interested in the fact that you are one of the guys who I think about a lot in terms of, you know, the, a lot of us in the, in the atheist free thought movement, you know, who are, we're activists in one way or another, you know, I'm a writer and a podcaster and, and I do a lot of online content, other people, you know, they work for organizations. Um, but you are, you know, you are like, I don't don't know, how would you describe it? Like a foot soldier for reason. And, uh, and I, I'm really excited. So I guess where we'll start tonight is my first question for you is like, what's your deconversion story? How did you come to, um, leaving religion or if you left religion at all and, um, and what got you interested in activism? Well, uh, before we get started, I want to thank you for inviting me on. Um, this is very exciting because like you said, it's one of the areas of activism that I really don't get into. I mean, I've been very fortunate to be invited to a bunch of them to discuss my activism and my deconversion story, but, uh, it's just one area that I just respect the hell out of people that have the time and the patience and the know-how to do. So I definitely hope this podcast explodes and just becomes beyond popular. Um, so with your question about my deconversion, you know, growing up, we weren't hardcore Christians, but there was an expectation of being a Christian in my house. I had divorced parents and my dad always pushed it more than my mom, but I always feel like my mom, I don't know, kind of felt pressure from society and felt pressure from my dad that, you know, to, to raise good kids, they will be in church. Now, looking back on it, if I can be very critical, um, my dad sold life insurance for a company that targeted Lutherans. So essentially, every Sunday going to church was basically an extension of his job. And so now as an adult, as a father of three, as a husband, it makes total sense why he obsessed about us being there. And his version of going to church was always, you will shave your face, you will wear nice clothes, you will wear a button on tie if you need to, you will wear nice nice socks, nice shoes. And, uh, he always, I, I remember him always saying, you are a reflection of me. So go out and represent me. And I always thought, wow, okay, no pressure there. I'm 10. <laughs> <laughs> <So>, wow. <laughs> yeah. And my deconversion story, 
is actually it spans over about 32 years as nuts as that sounds, but there was kind of a, a gap between the time that I got confirmed when I was 16 until I was probably 31 or 32 where organized religion played absolutely no part in my life. I mean, my wife and I got married in 2009 and she kind of grew up religious, but we both agreed we did not want a religious wedding. We did not want a religious ceremony. We kind of sprinkled in some very generic religious references uh, just to kind of appease people, just so they didn't think the baby sacrifice was about to start. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it wasn't until, yeah, it was probably when we had our second son that my dad started pressuring us about, hey, you better get those kids baptized. Hey, are you going to have them baptized? And I kind of sat there and I went, well, no, I'm not going to have him baptized. Are you kidding me? Like, I never used the A word around him at that time, but I think he had his assumptions. I mean, I think he could see, you know, we didn't go to church. We didn't go to Sunday school. Every time he would bring up the G-O-D, I would laugh at it. I would tease him. I would, you know, push back and say, you don't really believe that shit, do you? You don't really buy into that. I mean, come on now. And so it really lit a fire under me to start to research. Like, am I religious? Is my family going to be religious? Are my kids going to be religious? What does that even mean? And, um, it took, this is interesting. It took a stranger on a message board of all places to recommend that I don't go to a church. Don't be around pastors or people that go rah, rah for religion. Instead, he said, you know, look at all the religions out there, find their holy book and sit down and read it. And, you know, if it jives with you, great. And if it doesn't, start to go down the other path. And like I said, growing up, atheism was never an option. It was never like, okay, you can be a Christian, you can be a Jew, or you can be an atheist, whatever you want to be. It was always like, okay, do you want to be Missouri Senate Lutheran? Or do you want to be ELCA Lutheran? But just remember those Missouri Senates are kind of weird. So you don't want to be one of them. Well, let me, let me back back up just for a second, because that's interesting. Sure. So you're the second person I've heard talk about sort of the Missouri um, Synod or Synod or whatever it is. Sorry. Um, but uh, the other person who's mentioned it before I had spoken with him is Phil Ferguson, sure, yeah. who, who I think was a part of it, too. Could you briefly explain what that is? You know what? Your guess is as good as mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, Fair the enough. Way that it, the way that it was presented to me was that we were the less cultish Lutheran group and that the Missouri Synod was more of the hardcore. Like, I don't want to name drop, but I just enjoy when Matt Dillahunty, the great Matt Dillahunty, mm -hmm. says things like, if you want to hear what's wrong with Catholics, go ask the Protestants. If you want to hear what's wrong with the Baptists, go ask. It's, yeah. it's that kind of idea. You know, once I when I first heard him say that, I immediately thought of my dad making jokes about Missouri Senate Lutherans going, that's exactly what my dad used to do. That's exactly <laughs> what he used to do. I had a very so, I had a very similar uh, feeling about that kind of experience when there was like a quote from Dan Barker who said something along the lines of like, you know, there are just as many versions of Christianity as there are Christians. You rarely could you ever find two people in the same pew who, are, who would be at the same. And I always thought, wow, that's rather interesting because we often think of Christianity sort of being like a monolith. It's this thing, sort of an ideal. But in reality, it's actually comprised of, of billions of individual believers who all bring it to bring to it their own sort of biases or whatever. Um, so I always oh, yeah. thought that was rather interesting. Yep, exactly. And that is part of the reason why I'm glad I'm not a part of it anymore. And, <laughs> and especially being on the outside looking in now, um, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to research it. I, I probably care more about religion now than I ever did before. But it's to understand those differences. It's to understand which sects of Christian Christianity are more conservative versus the others. And it's trying to understand you know, if I do happen to see Christian protesters at a certain event, if I can understand what group they're a part of, then I understand what issues are important to them. So, but before we go down that rabbit hole, I want to get back to your question about deconversion. Um, looking into religion was one thing, but it was coming to terms with the A word. 
when they talk about when speakers and atheists talk about what that's like, it is frightening. It is exciting. It is scary. It is probably the most lonely moment of your life because you're sitting there going, holy shit. It's like you, the, the way I describe it is if you're a teenage boy and you discover Playboy's under your dad's bed and you're kind of looking around to make sure that nobody is, is watching you. And so at that moment, you're thinking, holy shit, did I just discover something I wasn't supposed to? And, and the thing I always say is like, once you discover atheism, once you know that it's okay to be an atheist, there's no turning back. These people that say that they used to be Christians and then they used to be atheists and now they're back to being Christians. I really wonder, I mean, I really wonder if they ever let go of it completely. You know, it, it's just, it blows my mind to think that somebody could go back to it. I understand why they would, but it just blows my mind that they could. Well, there's that great story about, um, I think probably the most blatant example that I can think of off the top of my head is the philosopher Anthony Flew. Um, Anthony Flew was in many, many ways sort of Dawkins before Dawkins. He was this sort of very erudite, often arrogant philosopher who who was who had written books on atheism and secular humanism and towards the very 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 end of his life he basically he didn't become a christian but he sort of became a sort of thomas paine jeffersonian-esque deist which was also the position that the skeptic martin gardner also held too um which i always thought was interesting because like martin gardner was like the king of the debunkers like him and james randy both but Gardner still believed in God, which I thought was rather interesting. Um, so I always am curious what with flu is like, what, what was it? Cause it, and he even was, I think fairly honest about it. I think he even said it was something along the lines of like, my reasonings behind it aren't terribly reasonable. They're, they, they're more emotional. Um, and he wrote a whole book about it and everything. And, and so sometimes, I mean, you don't hear it as much today, but back when that whole thing happened, people would say, see, see, one of yours went and been, went to be in a, a God fear, fear in person again. And I always, you'd always have to correct me. Well, he's not a Christian. He doesn't believe sort of in the anthropomorphic God or whatever. Um, yep. Yep. but, uh, it's so funny. It, Go ahead. I was just, gonna, I was just going to say, isn't it funny though, too, what the criteria is for being considered a real Christian? Yeah. You know, I always, I always ask about the comparison between Jeffrey Dahmer on his, on his, uh, I don't want to say deathbed, but you know, when he was convicted to die and then all of a sudden had this idea that I'm going to be a Christian right before. And then when you ask believers, so does that mean he's up in heaven, but all the Jews that rejected Christ are now burning in hell? I mean, what kind of shitty life is that, that you would be tortured and murdered by the, the, the Nazis? And then on top of that, you would be cast to a Christian hell for not believing. I just I don't understand their logic at all. Well, I think part of it is also the, the, the thing about it is that it's a certain compartmentalization. You, you take a very specific belief about God, and you, you put that there. And you have a very specific belief about hell, you put that there. And you have a very specific belief about morality and human interaction, you sort of put that there. And rarely do do they betwixt each other? Rarely do they come together. And right. so you and I, because we don't believe, we put all those together because, you know, we systematize it and go, well, it's supposed to be this way. A lot of believers just don't. And that's the thing that I've never really understood. Um, I don't want to overstep <laughs> my boundaries too much in terms of talking about my own deconversion, but I grew up basically non-religious. My parents were non-religious people. Um, my dad is, is not an, he doesn't, he doesn't like the term atheist, but he basically is one. Um, my mom isn't really religious. My mom is like a share a Christian meme on Facebook religious, but not really. <laughs> um, you know, my, you know, my, I've, I was never baptized. I, I can count on one hand the amount of times I've been to church for an actual service. So growing up, I never knew what atheism was because I never really had to. And what, what was the, the, the moment I learned about it when you were describing, like, it's kind of like finding playboys and you're like looking around. I was a high, I was in, I was a high school senior and I was looking up stuff at the library, at the, the high school library. And I was like researching people and I'm a huge fan of the new wave musician, Gary Newman. Um, and, uh, I, I just saw that his, there's a section in his Wikipedia page that says personal life. And the sentence that just says, Gary Newman is an atheist. And I was like, what the hell is that? 
Yeah, I, I can't believe I went 18 years without really hearing the word or knowing what that was. So I clicked sure. on it and I just read the wiki page on atheism and I realized I went, oh shit, <laughs> this is me. Like, you know, because I had, I had been in a bunch of different religions. You know, I, I had gotten into Buddhism because I was really into George Harrison and sitar music and Ravi Shankar. I had a Christian phase, which I always say was basically my version of being a Christian was listening to Bob Dylan's gospel records, um, you know, because of this girl I was dating who was religious. Um, but I, I religion has always been sort of an intellectual thing for me. I've never understood the emotional thing. I've never understood the communal communal thing. So I've always looked at it from sort of a perspective like a reporter. Um, and so it never made any sense. And then once I found this sort of wiki page in atheism, I went, oh, oh, okay, this is me. you know. And it was a moment where I was like in the library going like, oh, looking over my shoulder and being like, <laughs> is this real? Is this a possibility? Yeah, yeah. And isn't it fat? I don't apologize for sharing your story. I mean, okay. Help. First, it's your show. And second... <laughs> You know, there's going to be listeners out there that are going to hear this and say, wait a minute, here are two dudes that are walking the same path now, but boy, the way they got to where they're at now is completely different, which then will hopefully encourage them to understand that it doesn't matter what your path to atheism is. There is no perfect path. It's just once you arrive, then looking back on how the hell did you get here and how the hell can you go in and help others um, come to this path as well. So that's a fascinating story. I just, I'm so blown away. I mean, even you're only two states over from me mm -hmm. and it's, it's easy to just say we are basically living in the same state with just, you know, imaginary boundaries between us because we're in the Midwest, we're in the heartland. And it is pretty much expected that you will grow up a believer, a God fearing Christian. And so to know that we are separated by what a seven hour drive. And yet we had completely opposite upbringings. I mean, I remember I remember when I told my dad, yeah, you, you know I'm an atheist, dad, right? And he's like, well, you need to read the Bible. This is just a couple of years ago. And I, and I said, dad, you understand that I read the Bible more now than I ever did when I was a Christian or when, I, when you labeled me a Christian. And he makes the smart-ass comment of, oh, I'm surprised your hand doesn't burst into flames. And I'm like sitting there going, okay, one, I get it. You're my dad and you're struggling with this. But two – what the fuck does that mean? Like, what are you talking about? Like, has your hand ever caught fire from touching a book? I mean, come on. <laughs> I had a complete, I had a completely different experience with my dad. Um, you know, it, my dad was a huge influence on me being an atheist. Um, I think he's probably more comfortable with describing himself as a, as an agnostic. Um, um, cause he even still to this day will say something like, you got to believe in something, Justin, you know, yep. and he'll always talk about the Bob Dylan song, got to serve somebody, you know, it may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you have to serve somebody. And I always liked the fact that John Lennon, who was an atheist, wrote a reply song to Bob Dylan called Serve Yourself, um, uh, which I think is closer to, you know, because I never had a good answer to, you know, you got to serve somebody. And then I realized, I'm like, no, you, you, you serve yourself. And, uh, you know, and and my dad was one of those guys growing up where he was so cool. I mean, he was, my dad was really into the arts. My dad was really into music, you know, and, and he was, he loved Kurt Vonnegut. He was a huge Kurt Vonnegut fan. So he'd always tell me stories about Kurt Vonnegut. He'd always go, Justin, you're not old enough to read him yet. You're not old enough to read him. And then I finally got old enough to read him. I started reading Kurt Vonnegut, who is, you know, an atheist. He was a humanist. And, and, and um, there's a lot of humanism in his novels. And, you know, so I grew up with this sort of sense of irreverence where, you know, like, my parents didn't go to church. My sister went to church, but the only reason she did was for social obligations. She she sort of was religious because her friends were, and so she wanted to sort of fit in with them. But my sister really didn't embody Christian values, especially with the, you know, string of boyfriends she'd bring in and out of our house. Um, some of which I would find in very inappropriate situations <laughs> as a kid. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it's... Uh, so it's weird, like when people, like when Jerry DeWitt, you know, the, the Pentecostal preacher, you know, former Pentecostal preacher, now atheist, when he talks about like, yeah, I used to speak in tongues and I used to feel the Holy Ghost and, you know, I can speak in tongues and still feel the Holy Ghost. And I don't know, it's all bullshit. And I'm just like, how? How can you do that? Like, it's, how is there not like a moment in your head going like, this is all 
nonsense. Um, you know, Dan Barker tells the same thing. So like my thing when you were talking about earlier, like you're like you're more interested in religion now than you were when you were a believer. I was I'm the same way in the sense that I want to understand all the things that people like about religion that are don't have anything to do with like supernaturalism or irrationalism and that we can sort of take back as secular people and, and say, no, 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 we can do all of these things that you like that, and you don't yep. need to have any of these religious beliefs to do it. Yep. And then what we found though, is that for some folks, even experiencing that same euphoria is almost, is almost like a form of, a very small level PTSD. Like I'm not a trained therapist, psychologist, doctor by any means, so I don't want people blowing up the comment section saying, oh, my God, what is this atheist talking about? <laughs> but, but we've had many in our group um, that have said, I don't want that experience. I got out of that. I'm an atheist because I don't want to feel that anymore. And so, you know, it really is an interesting dilemma of how do you provide that? How do you provide these people with a sense of community, especially one that's very similar to what they used to get with religion? that doesn't provide the same baggage, the same threats, the same empty promises, um, and then make them flash back to a time that they want to forget. It's tough. Yeah, I think so. And then there's also just the other subsegment of people um, who are atheists who are like me and don't really care all that much about it. You know, it, I mean, I care about it in the sense that I want to learn about those things so that we as a people can do those things for people who need it. But like, I don't, I don't yearn for that sense of like fellowship that people have, I guess. I mean, I enjoy spending time with people. I, I love having friends, of course. I love my wife, you know, but I don't have that like sense of like, oh, I got to make the noodle, noodle casserole for everybody on Wednesday. Like yeah. I don't have that because, yeah. you know, maybe that's just a product of, you know, being a, a sort of a comfortably middle class white male in the sense that, you know, I have a certain level of sort of economic privilege where I can sort of just be more of an individual, but. No, I totally understand. I mean, I, we haven't even gotten past the deconversion part and I just love how this conversation is going, cool. but I, I think about what we're doing here in Eastern Iowa and I'm very much the same way. And it, when we first started the group, um, without jumping too far in front, go for it. I thought, I, I just kind of sat there and thought, okay, everyone's going to be on the same page. Everyone's going to be just as fired up as I am. And we're going to just hit the ground running. And the thing that I noticed and realized very quickly was that's not the case. And so you get those atheists that are very, you know, comforting and empathetic and they want to sit around and just share stories. Honestly, that's not even me. I mean, I love talking. I love sharing but if I have my choice between, hey, let's go out and, and hang out for brunch and, you know, spend two hours talking about the kids and catching up on our favorite TV shows versus, hey, let's go kick down the door of City Hall and tell this mayor he needs to figure his shit out. <laughs> I mean, give me the City Hall every day. But I mean, yeah, there's certain things that come with trying to inspire others to become as interested in the movement, you know, as motivated to get out there and, and change the world as, as some of us are. But on a very, very personal level, I'm much more into the independent. Let's just go do this. Let's just rock it. Let's not ask anybody permission. Let's just do it and see what happens. And, uh, it's been very entertaining to say the least to see how the dynamics work. So, well, you know, let's, I mean, was there anything else you'd like to speak to about your deconversion before we uh, move on to the, the yeah, other? Yeah, a um, couple, two, basically I'll, I'll narrow it down to two different things, and these are not my ideas. These are ideas that really helped me. Number one, if, it, if there's anybody out there listening that's in the closet, um, and I don't want to be offensive to the LGBT community when we use that phrase because they are very sensitive to that phrase because our coming out is nowhere near their coming out, but it's it kind of gives a visual of what the experience is like. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be simple. It's going to be messy. It's going to be the best and worst thing in the history of your life ever. And we just hope that you land on your feet. I mean, even if you're down and out about it and your whole family rejects you and your coworkers laugh at you and your best friends 
unfriend you and defriend you and whatever, it will get better. I mean, seriously, like the next day you will wake up and you will be so happy that you just told one person and day after day after day, it'll get easier and it'll get easier. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's times even me, I mean, I've been in the international headlines for doing this and there's still days where I take a deep breath before I leave the house and I go, what I'm about to do, how is this going to impact me a week from now? How is this going to impact me a month from now? How's it, how's it going to impact my wife and kids? Uh, secondly, this is probably the most important one. I'm very fortunate that I'm self-employed. Uh, I have a great wife, a great support system. I have great clients uh, that support my work. So I don't have the fear of an employer firing me. I don't have the fear of, you know, is my 30 year career going to come crashing down on me because somebody heard that I was out protesting something. If you're in a situation where you can't come out, don't. And you hear this all the time. And it's, it's to those of us that are in this world all the time, it sounds like a broken record, but if you're not in a position to come out, there's no rush. I mean, take your time, do it the right way. Make sure you have your ducks in a row. Make sure you have a support system that can catch you. So anyway, now I sound like a licensed therapist and I'm not, so I'm going to stop on that. <laughs> no, no, I, I think those are wonderful things to say. I mean, it's it's part of the reason why I'm so vocal about it, because I'm in a position where I can be. I've never had my life or my career or my livelihood ever threatened because I'm an atheist. Um, yep. And in that regard, I've been very lucky. You know, I've, I've probably, in the last seven years, I've probably only been unemployed a week. Um, uh, you know, I, and fortunately for me, you know, I get to do what I love. I, I work every day as a public historian and, and, you know, I work for a state agency. And so that does come with a certain level of perks in the sense that it's very, very hard to fire a state employee because they are something. Um, sure. it, even in Indiana, we have a very, actually we have a fairly robust civil rights commission in Indiana. Um, and so it's very hard for people to be fired on the basis of that. Um, and that's part of the reason why I do what I do, because I know there's so many people who can't. And I think it is um, selfish of me uh, to not do something, because it, it is, you know, it is imperative that if, for those of us who can be out and open and, and in any way, shape, or form be an activist, I think we should be. Um, because one of the reasons for that, beyond just you know fighting for separation of church and state and for a more reasonable world, is the is the the understanding that people will become more and more comfortable with people who are atheists or just non-believers in any sort of stripe. You know, I remember when I started my internship, my first internship in the public history program uh, in graduate school, I worked as a tour guide for the Indiana State House, um, and I remember one time I was talking to somebody and they and they said something along the lines because I you know I'm very political and so I talked about some political stuff and they said you know Justin you should run for office I said well I, I mean I, I there's no way I could win and they're like why and I said well one I'm a liberal and two I'm an atheist there's no way I could win and and they were like really and I was like yeah I'm I'm a non-believer I have no interest in being religious um, but I very much believe in in people believe in what they want, I believe in freedom of conscience, but I, I'm not a, a religious person. And they were like, oh, that's interesting. Cause you so, you're so nice. Yep. You know, <laughs> you, you know, you seem, you know, and, and when people first meet me, they often, and this is not trying to blow smoke up my ass. People can tear <laughs> me down anywhere else they want, but I, I, you know, there's something I think very traditionally American about me in the sense that, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a cis white male. I, you know, I love politics. I'm really into, to, you know, you know, I love rock and roll. I, I love driving my car. You know, you know, I, I live, you know, I love, you know, I love ribs and corn on the cob, and mashed potatoes and, you know, that kind of shit. And, you know, and I like watching shit blow up in movies and I like guns and I like boobs and, you know, and so, I, you know, there are things about me that are sort of quintessentially American, but then people, and then, you know, and then they realize, oh no, there's this whole other side to you. And, and so anyway, I'm kind of rambling at this point, but, but the main point I want to drive home is that, you know, I agree with you. If you can be out, be out and be out openly and forcefully, because for every person that can't be out, you're sort of an indirect voice for them. 
And, oh, yeah. um, and that's not just people in our country who face you know, losing employment or, or losing their spouse or their family or something like that. That's for also all of the you know, secular and atheist ex-Muslims in the Middle East who live under threat of death because of what they, they no longer believe. And so oh, yeah. I think it is, I think, unconscionable that if you, 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 you have a voice and you don't use it. And not even a loud voice. You don't yeah. have to go out and do what I've done. I mean, just you know, we moved to a new town a year ago, and it, we went from a town of 70,000 with you know, 60% of the people identifying as non-religious to all of a sudden a town of 1,800, which is probably 80 to 90% religious, and 80% of the town voted for the guy in office now. And uh, I'm going to see if I can make this entire episode without saying his name. If I say his name... <laughs> I want somebody to like ring a bell or something, but I'll put in, I'll put in a beep or something in post. Yeah. 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 Uh, the first question we were asked when we went to this event was, Oh, what church do you go to? And I, I still kick myself because last year my answer was we don't go around here because that, of course I wanted to make that good first impression and I didn't want there to be any unneeded drama. I mean, we're literally still unpacking the U-Haul and at that time we're thinking, okay, I've done a little bit of activism. People might know me, but let's just see how this goes first. Let's get them to know who we are. Kind of like you described where that must have been your Hillary moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But her emails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But his atheism. <laughs> like, let's, let's get to the point where that doesn't have to be said. But his atheism. But her atheism. Like, I just I can't stand that whole idea. That's true, because we don't do that to people who are believers. We don't say, oh, yep. they're nice and wonderful people. Oh, but he's a Christian. But we don't. Now, it's, inter it's interesting. The viewers can't see it, or the listeners can't see it, because we're not doing video. But mm -hmm. over, your, over your left shoulder is a picture of who? Oh, yeah. Um, in, my, in my office here, I have a poster of um, John F. Kennedy. Uh, it's a campaign well, poster, yeah. But he's a Catholic. Yes. Yes. And, and I mean, that... that that was said 50 years ago. I mean, and that was used as a centerpiece of the opposition to him. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we can even go all the way back, you know, as a historian, I can't help it. Um, in 1928, the Democratic Party ran a guy named Al Smith. And Al Smith was also a Demo uh, was also a Catholic. And they said the exact same things about Al Smith in 1928 when he ran against Ho Herbert Hoover that they said about Kennedy in 1960. Almost identical. Even with the with the editorial cartoons, they would draw. Car they did this cartoon of Al Smith at a cabinet meeting, and with like all of his cabinet officers, and then the Pope. And they did the same thing with Kennedy, which is why Kennedy gave this amazing speech in the summer of 1960, um, where he he. It's one of the most eloquent and forceful defenses of secularism that I've ever heard. Um, I know FFRF used it, uh, the Freedom for Religion Foundation used it in ads a couple years ago. Um, and hell, even Nixon, who people know, you know, as sort of a villain of American history, even Nixon came out and defended Kennedy from those attacks, from, his own, from Nixon's own supporters. He said, look, the man's religion has nothing to do with this. Well, this is about the issues. And that's, I mean, that's crazy to think that Nixon did that, which, by the way, Nixon identified as a Quaker, which is kind of funny. Sure. But, um, hey, really quick, really quick, can I just jump in and say that please. in the last, when did we start this, 20 minutes ago? Yeah, 25 minutes. Yeah. In the course of 20 to 25 minutes, I have learned more about American political history than I ever did in my high school <laughs> civics class. Oh, nice. Like, like I think this is, I think this is must listen to uh, podcasting right here. I think they should air this in every classroom across the country. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, that's no, very this kind. Is, this is fun. So that's very kind. I, I love history. It's my, it's been my life's passion and, you know, and, and, um, you know, I, you know, my scholarship was an extension of my activism. You know, you talked about the activism you do, and we'll, we'll get into that here in a sec, but you know, the activism that I did was I wrote my master's thesis on a 19th century free thinker and wrote about his contributions to intellectual life in that period. 
And then I gave talks all around the state where, you know, I, I talked at Unitarian churches. I spoke at CFI in Indianapolis and, and shared my research with people and intend to try to share it uh, for this other compendium of Midwestern intellectual history. Um, I realized a long time ago that my version of activism was being sort of a thought leader. That was what I like to do. I'm a communicator and I'm a, a, a writer and, and, and a scholar, and that's kind of what I do. Um, because I am, and we'll transition now, I am absolutely inspired and by the brass balls that you have. In, yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of what you do. So to give people some context, so the first time I had ever heard about you was um, either you had gone on um, Free Thought Radio either maybe a year or so ago, or I saw a pictures of you in the Freedom From Religion Foundation's newspaper, um, Free Thought Today. And it was about you meeting all of these presidential candidates and wearing a shirt that says, like, I'm an atheist and I vote, or I'm an atheist voter, and asking them questions about um, uh, separation of church and state, and in many ways, sometimes compelling them to give you an answer. And I thought, this dude's got fucking balls. <laughs> like, that is, I wouldn't even do that, you know? And I like to think of myself as kind of, of a forceful guy, but I wouldn't have the courage to do that. So let's, so how did you... Now that you've deconverted, you're now an atheist. How did you get into activism, and and how did you get to the place where you were comfortable asking um, future leaders of the free world um, what they thought about church state issues? I'd like to give you a quick answer. I I don't even know what a quick answer is, so bear with me. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, yeah. So I'm a small business owner. I'm a professional photographer, and so as I'm trying to book jobs and I'm responding to phone calls and I'm typing emails. I'm also trying to update my income and expense log. And one day I just grow tired of it. I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm tired of entering numbers. I'm tired of reconciling my bank statements. There's gotta be something more to do. So I jump on Facebook and I start scrolling down. And, uh, before I get to the gist of that, I had started watching, uh, podcast and, and different shows and there was one interview where Aaron Ra had David Silverman, president of American Atheists, on. And, Amer and Dave is a fiery guy, but he's very well thought out. He definitely has a plan for everything he's doing. He's not doing it just, be just to get a rise out of people. He has a, a plan in, in place. And he was talking about how it's not good enough to be an atheist. Just going out and saying, hey, I'm an atheist. Like, okay, great. Big whoop. What else are you doing? And I remember him getting fiery at the end of this interview saying, if you have an opportunity to go out and do anything with your atheism, do it. Don't think twice about it. Get off your ass and go do it. So fast forward back to that day on board, I'm scrolling through Facebook, and all of a sudden our local radio station says, hey, Rick Santorum was going to be at a pizza shop for uh, a presidential campaign stop for the Iowa caucus. And I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fucking do this. I'm going to go out. And I'm going to ask him questions because that's what Dave told me to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, very much like you just described, you know, I've never been the type to, to fear things. I, I just I just don't. I just go into these situations and I'm like, I mean, if your boss told you to do something, you would just do it. So I kind of I, I don't want to say Dave was my boss, but in that atheist world, I needed that kick in the ass. Like, OK, great. I reject the, a belief in God. But now what? So. I grab, grab my wallet, I grab my smartphone, and I hit the road, and it was like a three-minute drive, and I'm thinking, oh, shit, I don't even know what I'm going to ask him. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I Google his name, and I type in the word atheist because I thought, well, maybe there's something that he said about atheists that I can use. And by the time I get there, he hadn't arrived yet. So I walk into this pizza shop. And they have the, you know, the, the room, the back room set up for him. And then he realizes his people realize there's not going to be enough people there to make it a big deal. So they usher us all out to the eating space. So you literally have people that are there on their lunch hour that are not there for him. So <laughs> he, comes, he comes walking in. And I mean, I've been around political figures before as a photographer. I've had the opportunity to photograph many political events. But I hadn't been on this side as kind of the citizen activist or as a citizen reporter, if you will. So I wait for him to make his rounds. 
And that's when the goosebumps and the butterflies kick in like, holy shit, I'm here. I'm doing this. Like there's no turning back. So you better be ready. And I'm literally positioning my smartphone behind a cup of pop and I'm trying to like hide it because I wasn't sure like, are they going to kick me out? If I, if I drop the word atheist, are they going to freak on me? What's going to happen? And finally he starts talking about something and I get very passionate about it. And it was like at that moment, everything I had worried about just disappeared. And I said, Mr. Santorum, I have a question for you. And he's like, yeah, go ahead. Now I got to add in here. It was kind of a buffet restaurant. Mm-hmm. So he's literally reaching behind himself, grabbing chicken off of the buffet. That's funny. And, and then he's like trying to eat it while I'm asking him. But I said, Mr. Qu- Santorum. Chef, qu- quick question real quick before you get yeah. into it. Can you confirm or deny that he wore a sweater vest? Ooh, you know what? I, I can't let, hold on. I'm going to find, <laughs> I'm going to find a photo. The man is known for his sweater vests. People. Yeah, there's a fo- photo of me out there from that day, and I want to see. <laughs> nope, he had, a, he had a dress shirt that okay. was unbuttoned with no tie and a dress coat. Right on, right on. I figured I'd oh. ask. He is known for yeah. his sweater vests. He, he kind of looks like a derpy Jerry Seinfeld when he wears them. <laughs> so that's why I asked. Please, all right, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. With, with, with not as deep pockets as Jerry. No, absolutely not. So anyway, I just said, hey, uh, and I don't remember exactly how I worded it, but I kind of said, hey, uh, I'm an atheist, and you've said a lot of crappy things about atheists. Like, why should atheists vote for you? And then he just answered, and nothing happened. That's awesome. And he just, and he just kept talking. And the thing was, I was, so, I was so locked in on him that I didn't even look around the room to get the reaction to record it in my head of like, how everybody else responded. Because remember, this is my hometown. So everybody there only knows me as, oh, there's that camera guy. There's that photo guy. Like, what's he doing here? He doesn't have his camera with him. (laughs) Now, fast forward a couple months, and I go to an event with Marco Rubio. Now, that is at a country club. Now, this is a couple months into it. So a couple weeks into it, I should say. So by then, I kind of know the routine you know, have all your stuff out when you walk in. Don't do anything that throws off his people or whatever. And I grab a seat right in the middle of the room. There's probably 150, 200 of us. And Mr. Rubio goes on with his speech and says, hey, does anybody have a question? And by then, I picked up on there's always aides with microphones. So I tried to position myself right by one. I said, yeah, I do. And uh, they said, all right, go ahead. By then, I... The, the, the saying is all out of fucks. I was completely out of fucks at that point <laughs> in the sense of I am here as a voter and you are going to answer my question whether you like it or not. And I don't care if you don't like my question. I'm a taxpayer. I'm a constituent. I'm a person of this country. Answer my question. So I got up and I said, Mr. Rubio, just seems like a lot of your campaign ads don't focus on how you're going to fix our country. They talk, they talk a lot about how you love Jesus and you want to go to heaven. I said, but as an atheist, that does nothing for me. And I'm sure many atheists feel the same way. I said, so here's my question. Are you running for commander in chief or pastor in chief? And I tell you what, that room, you should have seen the looks on their faces. I mean, actually, you can go to my YouTube channel and you'll see the looks on their faces. I mean, you want to talk about privilege, (laughs) privileged white people, Christians, having their little Christian privilege just grabbed by both hands and shaken. I mean... Which if just, I which if I remember, uh, of all of the people you talked to, of all the candidates you talked to, I think the, the response that I hated the most that I read was Rubio's because I found it to yeah. be the most patronizing, self-serving oh, yeah. bullshit um, uh, that I had that that could have come out of a politician's mouth about your question. I, and I and I don't remember it verbatim, but it was something along the lines of like, you know, I have you know i've accepted jesus christ as my as my savior and hopefully someday you will too and something like that and i just wanted to go fuck you like that's not at all what he asked you yep here's kind of what he here's kind of what he said i'm reading this online he goes quote no one's gonna force you to believe in god okay what what relevance does that have to my question yeah yeah then he says but no one's gonna force me to stop talking about god Okay, still not part of my question, had nothing to do with what I asked him. I just simply said, how do you plan on fixing the country? And then he says, no one's going to take away my right and your right to live out the teachings of your faith. No one. 
if that, I mean, it was a living, breathing example of Christian privilege in this country. Yeah. It's the I, Christian persecution in this country. The idea that if you are challenged on your religion, somehow you are being told, shut it down, shut down the churches, you know, get rid of them, stop being religious. And it's the biggest load of bullshit in this country. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I just found his answer. And part of it was also just the fact that, that Marco Rubio is one of those people where, you know, in politics, we would call him an empty suit. Um, oh, yeah. You know, he's there's not much going on. I mean, this is a guy who because I know a lot of people compared him to Obama being young and kind of minority and whatever and kind of changing the party. First off, that's an insult to Obama. And, yep. and, and, and and second of which, Marco Rubio is somebody like, you know, who it's real. It was really funny watching the debates because you'd have Marco Rubio, you'd have Ted Cruz, and they would sort of try to out immigrant each other, like sh like trying to <laughs> tell their stories about being immigrants while simultaneously shitting on immigrants. It was the yep. weirdest fucking thing I've ever heard. Yep. And um, with Rubio, you know, going back to the comparison of Obama. I don't remember Obama trying to hijack somebody's video, which their campaign did to me because as soon as we uploaded it, Time Magazine jumped on it, Huffington Post did stories. I mean, this thing exploded. I had gotten into my vehicle, my phone just started blowing up about, oh my goodness, did you see the news and did you see the headlines from all my friends? And I thought, holy crap, I must have done something there. And then I find out that his team has downloaded my, uh, apparently, allegedly, uh, downloaded my video from YouTube and then uploaded it on their campaign YouTube channel and um, basically spin, you know, spun it off as if it was their own video. But That's remarkable. In, in a sense, that actually kind of helped because after about five days, the, the video as a whole had 15 million views. I mean, this thing just spread like wildfire. People were just freaking out. Oh, there's Rubio and he's a savior and he's a second coming and look at him. And I just went, yeah, he's third in the polls he's like two weeks out from getting his ass kicked he needs basically i helped fuel a last ditch effort on his part that's by going out that's fucking amazing out confronting him that's you know? fucking amazing i mean what i told people when we were talking about it you know because at the time i was doing a different podcast i was talking with a friend and you know i said you know when when the election is written about there's a few sort of key things that people will write about Obviously, people will write about 45. <laughs> well done. Well Obviously, done. people will write about Clinton. Obviously, people will write about, um, you know, the other candidates or whatever. But to me, there were two stories that really blew my mind about the election in general. One was just the success of Bernie Sanders, the fact that Bernie Sanders did as well as he did. And the fact that, in my opinion, he gave the best answer to your question um, uh, you know, it was a full throated defense of secularism, which was f fucking refreshing considering how many theocrats you talk to and, and the fact that you did what you did. I mean, and I'm not trying to like, like blow smoke up your ass. I really do think that you doing what you did and, and people seeing it, like just people, the act of the very act of people seeing it was sort of an albatross moment in the sense that, you know, there, there are probably scores of people, and you've probably heard from them. There are scores of people who saw that and went, yeah, yeah, damn it. <laughs> you know, we're a huge part of this country. You know, yep. for example, um, the PRRI, the Public Religion uh, Research Institute, they did a, a study about religiosity and voting. And in one of the, the studies, they made a point of like, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, they represent a, a sizable amount of the American public, but a very small portion of the electorate. So they were talking about the 2012 election. They didn't have data for 2016 yet, but they were talking about the 2012 election and they said, you know, there's about 20, 25% of people who identify as sort of non-religious and yet only about, you know, 12% of them actually voted in the 2012 election. And I thought to myself, you know, and Bill Maher has made this point too. You know, we are a bigger demographic than African Americans. We're a bigger Af we're a bigger demographic than than the the LGBT community. We're a larger demographic than than Jewish people. You know, we're second only to evangelicals, and yet we don't assert ourselves. 
And, and part of it is out of fear. Part of it is out of social ostracism. But I saw you doing what you did. And I said, there's a man who looked the world in the face and said, no, I'm going to do it. And that was remarkable. I mean, and I and I don't mean that to 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 you know to boost your ego, but I, I really do. And, and in the sense that I think when the histories of this election are written, people are going to talk about the fact that this was one of the first elections where the where atheists asserted themselves. So much so, in fact, that the Democratic convention, not the Republican convention, but the Democratic convention, even said um, multiple times they sort of threw you know. Um, you know, pithy things about non-believers. They even said things about non-believers. It was total pandering, but I'll take it because that's the first time we'd ever been pandered to. So, yep. I mean, I think that part of that pandering that happened at the DNC is because of you. Woo. Hold on. Let me think about that. Holy shit. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, and that's part of the reason I wanted to talk to you because I really do yeah. think of what you did was such um, a, a, a courageous thing. And I think a, such a badly fucking needed thing, you know, but because these people go out, these theocrats go out every day, you know, hell I live with one for four fucking years in Mike Pence where, you know, they go out every fucking day and just say insane bullshit and nobody yep. checks them. Nobody, yep. nobody yep. asks them like counter questions, nothing. And here's you with a fucking atheist shirt on, you know, fucking balls of steel just going like, yeah, you know, I don't really give a shit about your whole religion thing. <laughs> how do you feel about, you know, how do you feel about sub healthcare subsidies or how do you feel about the Medicaid expansion? Like those are actual questions. Right, right. Um, I thought long and hard about it, but I try to focus on the, uh, the future. I try not to sit and, you know, think about what I did because I'm already thinking about 2018 elections here. Mm -hmm. I'm, t I'm already thinking about the 2020 election. Uh, but looking back at what I did, I had no idea about the bigger picture. You know, it was just more of like one man's little journey down this path that had never been taken for all things I can do. I mean, all the research I've done. I mean, yeah, you had Madeline Murray O'Hare and she was pissing people off. But I don't know that there was this like grassroots level activism from anybody atheist let alone secular and and i hope somebody out there can en enlighten me because i'm not the most educated man i mean i have degrees from community colleges I, I i worked hard for them but i am nowhere near the level of intelligence and and breadth of intellectual world that you are but you know looking back at what i did it was more about just doing it it wasn't about being perfect it wasn't about having the perfect question. It was just about walking up to a door and saying, hi, I want in, let me in. And then waiting for their response. And of course, at first it was scary as shit because it was like, okay, my reputation, you know, what people think of me, um, going to jail for whatever. I mean, you, you hear stories all the time of assholes that think because you're an atheist, you're just there to, you know, do whatever, but kind of funny i'm gonna i'm gonna bring in something that maybe a portion of your listeners don't know about but some of them might know and they'll go oh my god i know exactly what he's talking about are you a fan of the show lost i've i've heard of it i i've not really watched okay. it that much give you the premise of it it was kind of a sci-fi type show it, it was drew massive ratings a couple years back um it's known for having one of the shittiest endings ever to a series but besides that like the first season of it is just brilliant tv and in the first, I think it's the first episode, this plane wrecks on an island and the characters are starting to get to know each other. There's a one character named Jack and he tells a story of being a surgeon. And there's this woman that's on the beach with him and she's kind of talking to him and you can kind of feel the sexual tension between them. And they face this horrible plane wreck and there's just destruction everywhere. And she looks at him and she says, you're not scared. Like, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, we're all panicking, and you're just like, whatever, I got this. You know, they had some amazing writers at the start, and Jack's character says, well, I'm a surgeon, and I was working on this uh, patient's sack of nerves or something, and he said, I accidentally cut it open. And all these nerves started coming out like 
uh, I think he said like um, noodles, like little tiny string noodles. And he said, in that moment, I let fear take over. He goes, I let fear completely take over my body for five seconds. And then I counted to five and then I was done. And at that moment, I pushed the fear aside and I marched forward. And it's really weird because I don't watch a lot of TV. You know, I barely watch movies. I mean, the other day I realized I hadn't even seen the movie Jaws yet. But it was it was kind of that idea that I took with me of when I went into these rooms and I went into these town halls and I went into these cafes and pizza shops where I said, okay, you're scared, you're nervous, you don't know what's going to happen, let's count to five, and then let's go knock this fucking door down. Because, because – they don't know my lack of experience with this. When you walk into a room, you're just a pack of angry wolves to them or hungry wolves to them. So if you can come off with that confidence, they won't know whether this is your first time or a thousandth time doing it. So if I can encourage your listeners to go out and type in lost, jack, and fear and watch that clip, it's like two minutes long. If that moment doesn't light a fire under your ass and make you just say, you know what? I have no excuses. Like, yeah, I can be scared, but you know how many people in the history of humanity have been scared? You, you imagine all the atheists and all the doubters and all the people that challenged the Catholic church back in the day and then were burned alive at the stake. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine the fear they had. We're just going to get a bunch of dirty looks. I mean, obviously, don't get me wrong. There are situations where people are heckled and bullied and, you know, harassed and all that. But I have every reason. I live in the middle in the, in the Midwest. I had every reason to be ridiculed, harassed, you know, have my shit vandalized. It's never happened. Like yeah. the only thing I ever got in the mail was like something without a return address. And it was an invitation to attend a church. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, tried to kill you with kindness. Hadn't, there hasn't been any physical threats, mm -hmm. verbal threats. And don't get me wrong. I mean, if this train keeps rolling, I'm yeah. sure I'm going to run into it. But going back to your question about balls of steel, and I really am honored that you would say that because coming from somebody who understands how to piece things together over many, many years as a historian, while I appreciate that and I'm excited about what the future holds, I was actually left feeling unsatisfied by my efforts. And it wasn't about my efforts. Mm -hmm. And I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to piss a bunch of atheists off right here, but now I'm really starting to get pissed off about it. Go for it. There was a great opportunity on February 2nd, the day after the Iowa caucus was decided, for the next round of atheist activists to grab their shit, get in line, and go marching. We had New Hampshire. We had Nevada. We had South Carolina. We had every reason to say, look at what this, di this dude, this random dude, this father of three, this random guy did in Iowa. Let's go fucking do that. Let's go out. And and take take the torch that he lit, which I didn't let I didn't light it. Somebody you know many many years Ingersoll and Madeline Murray O'Hare and all these wonderful people, they're the ones that lit it. I just happen to like grab a twig and go, hey, I'll take some of that, <laughs> you know. But then it never happened. I mean, yes, there were major nonprofit groups out doing it. Yes, there were probably small nonprofit groups that were talking about it that maybe went out to events for a different issue, but never brought atheism to the forefront and never bothered to say, hi, I'm an atheist. Here's my question. Even the simple act of just saying that sentence, hi, I'm an atheist. You walk into a room of religious people and say that, it sets the tone for that entire town hall. And it lets people know mm -hmm. this is not going to be a goddamn revival. This is not going to be a church service. Sorry, now I'm getting amped. Can you No, talk? go for it, brother. I go mean, for it. It just... It just drives me nuts looking back at that and then piecing it together on a bigger, uh, bigger stage and saying, where were the riots? Where were the pro not, not, not violent riots, but you know what I mean? Like, where was the marching in the street? Where were the atheists finally coming together saying, like, kind of like the science march and kind of like the, the reason rally? Well, you know, I think part of it had to do with the fact that it had this election had a huge enthusiasm gap. If, if you look at if you look at sort of exit polling, 10 million less people voted in the 2016 presidential election than voted in 2012. Yeah. And part of it was the fact that, in my opinion, 
The Democratic Party nominated the worst Democratic candidate since George McGovern. Um, I think if she couldn't beat the guy who's in office now, she couldn't beat anybody. Um, and and I like Hillary Clinton. I think she would have been a fine president. That's not my beef. My beef is the fact that she was absolutely uninspiring. Um, it was like it was like having like Obama for eight years, who's like the cool dad that everybody loves, and then like the old ass aunt who like eats cashews out of the glass bowl and like gives you snide comments about what book you're reading. Like that's what it was yep. replaced with. And, yep. and it says a lot about where the democratic party was when the most inspiring and invigorating candidate, especially for young people was a 74 year old socialist from Vermont that speaks volumes about where the party was in its failings. And on the flip side of that, you have to look at where the Republicans were. There were so many of them. I mean, goddamn, you could fucking throw a rock and you'd hit a GOP candidate. Um, <laughs> there was like 16 or 17 of them. I mean, I watched the debates. There was the A team and there was like the, there was the there was the A team and there was the B team. There was like the kids table. And the yep. only one that even remotely spoke some semblance of sense was John Kasich and hell even then he said some crazy shit. So yep. There was that problem. The other problem is, from what I gather, from what I read, the reason rally wasn't that well attended the, last year either, and that it wasn't as big as 2012, that, that, that there was some, from what I remember hearing, there was some infighting about the harassment policy or some shit, and that, you know, there, and there's a lot of infighting going on within the secular movement right now, just in general. And, you know, and it all happened, I think, because, you know, we were so complacent. Like I said, we had the cool black guy for eight years. You know, it made the people who sort of side with us, you know, people who are for separation of church and state for science and critical thinking tend to be liberal. And they just kind of were like, yeah, everything kind of sucks, but we got the cool black guy in office. And so they, they, there was not the incentive. Now that, you know, uh, you know, that Orange Crush is in the fucking White House, people are, 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 you know, marching. They're going through the streets. It's like, where the fuck were you? Six months ago, this could have been completely different. Well, I have to say that before I became – long before I became an atheist activist, and I, I go on record all the time by saying this statement. I'm very liberal as well, but in my activism, that is not important. It's not relevant. What is important is I have a core group of issues that are important to me from an atheistic perspective, from a secular perspective. So with that said – if you align with these issues, then I'm cool with you. Like, obviously, on my private personal level, I'm going to argue with you if you say you're a libertarian, and I'm going to argue with you if you, you know, talk about uh, defunding Planned Parenthood and cutting Medicaid and all those things. But what really got me into this whole activism thing was George Bush. And I just, I used to think I despised that man. <laughs> no, it's a whole new level of, of despising somebody now. Oh, I mean, yeah. I hate to think. I hate to say it. I mean, war crimes and everything. I'd rather have George Bush now. Yeah, shit. But, I mean, you're absolutely right. But I'll tell you, with George Bush, I mean, you at least knew where he was on issues. And you you could kind of piss and moan about his stance on WMDs in Iraq and how his religion influenced him and all this kind of stuff. But you you never – I don't feel I was ever threatened. And, and I'm a privileged white man. But, like, I don't – I think the way people are threatened today, it has woke up the complacent people. It has kicked that apathy to the curb in terms of yes. this, is, this is what happens. I mean, elections have consequences. This is what happens when you don't care. And I yeah. just – I mean, look at the people that didn't, that didn't like the guy in office when he was a candidate but then owned up to the fact – that they just wanted a conservative Supreme Court justice. So they said, you know what? I'm just going to pinch my nose and swallow it because if we can get a conservative justice on, on, you know, on the court, we're good. We're good. We got everything we needed. No, and you're absolutely right. And on the Democratic end of it, I can tell you right now, at least for me, because I was a Bernie Sanders supporter. I voted for him in the primary. I gave money to his campaign. Um, I thought he was the logical next step after Obama, I thought like there's Obama and then Bernie is a step onto that, 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 that Obama sets the tone for a new generation of sort of liberal, uh, progressive politics. And, but when Scalia died, when Justice Scalia died, I said, fuck it. 
I have to put my pettiness aside now because, yeah. you know, they're, we're bound to have a conservative majority on the court for 50 years. And, yeah. and it's, and that, and the thing is like, liberals don't care about that. Conservatives super fucking care about the Supreme Court. They are obsessed with it. They have, they spend all kinds of money. They have all kinds of groups and they really fucking care about it. Liberals don't, which doesn't make any fucking sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, outside of like Planned Parenthood and like the secular groups that, you know, like Second Coalition for America, Americans United, you know, FFRF, like liberals don't give a fuck about the Supreme Court, which is ridiculous because that they should care because the, the policies that people create that are crafted in the other branches of government are ultimately upheld by that branch. So that never makes any sense to me. Um, the other part of it is, is that, you know, there is that ongoing debate about did Hillary, you know, use too much of identity politics? Was identity politics a problem? Was she running an election that was years ahead of its time in the sense of she was run? I think she was running a campaign where she thought the demographics are where they're going to be in like 2024 or 2028 when there will be enough minorities who can vote so that Democrats can sort of have a permanent electoral um, uh, uh, advantage. But, but, um, Anyway, I kind of lost where I was going with this. I'm sorry. No, well, let me ask you this. Yeah. You feel, sorry to change the roles on this. No, please, you, by all means. Do you feel that that complacency, that that apathy, because yo, we had the cool black president for so long, and and, and color's not an issue. But no, just, I mean, but but exactly. I, I loved Obama. Me I voted too. For him twice. I was a. I don't think I was a precinct captain for him, but I was. I, I just thought, I just thought, what a fantastic, what a fantastic American. I mean, yes. forget president. What a fantastic American. Do you feel like some liberals and, and Democrats just looked at it like, well, Hillary's our inevitable su successor to him. So, yeah, you know we're not going to lose the Supreme Court seat. You know we're not. I mean, I can honestly admit I, I had something going on on election night, so I didn't even get home till probably eight or nine. I walked in thinking, hey, has she won yet? I mean, did they call it yet? And then my wife like kind of looked at me like, uh, you're going to want to come in and take a seat and like, hey, hold my hand because as soon as you start seeing these results, it's going to crush you. And I'm just hoping that this disaster of an election, and I don't mean just the votes, but I mean the entire process. I mean, the way the Democratic Party acted, just all of it lights a new fire because yes, it's lit a fire with the indivisible group and it's lit a fire with all these other groups. But I heard something very important on a local level here in Iowa is yeah, that's fine to do that now, but guess what? Summer comes, county fairs come, then uh, vacations happen and then school starts again. Are you going to have that same fire in October, a year before the 2018s that you had back in March? Yes. Or, or is it going to just conveniently go by the wayside because, well, you know what? He's in office now, and we've got that conservative justice, and it's all just going to come crumbling, so who gives a shit? I mean, that, Plus, I always, I, that's almost more scary now yeah. than, than facing a Gorsuch or, you know, Captain Orange face. Like I mean, I, I agree, and, 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 it, and it, it, you know, and here's what I'll also say. Never underestimate the, the ability of the Democratic Party to fuck up an election. <laughs> um, they do it routinely, uh, you know, and, and they're my party. That's why I say it like this, because liberals are pussies. Um, I mean, I, I'm sorry. Like I, I grew up, my dad is, you know, a, a liberal, you know, he's an old school liberal. And I grew up hearing stories about John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and, and hearing about FDR and these presidents who are larger than life men who ruled politics, who, who, who grabbed the process by the balls and owned it. You know, uh, Lyndon Johnson was corrupt as all fuck, but the difference is that Lyndon Johnson used the power of the presidency to do so much good for the country. He tends to get mired in Vietnam, but, but he's one of the, I mean, Medicare, Medicaid, um, the, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, NPR, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the War on Poverty, Housing and Urban Development. That's all him. That's all oh. him. He didn't know that. That's awesome. You know, he, he did that in a span of, 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 you know, six and a half years when he was president. 
And, you know, Democrats used to dream big. They used to do big things. But the problem is, is that they're so afraid of going in front of voters and we're talking about sort of atheists, right? They're so afraid of going into the in front of the voters and going, yes, I support infrastructure spending. Yes, I support universal right. health care. Right. Yes, I support these things. They're fucking cowards. And that's why they lose. Because if the choices to people are Republican and Republican light, people will choose Republican. They don't give a shit because they don't see much of a difference between the two. Well, and it, and I can speak to that myself because as an uninformed 18-year-old, the first person I voted for was George Bush. But you know why what why it was? Because to me, he had a spine and Al Gore didn't. Yeah, that makes at, perfect at that sense. Time, I was I was 18 and I watched two debates and I didn't know what the hell Medicaid was. I was 18, I didn't know. Yeah, but I just sat there. I just sat there, and when they asked George Bush, now obviously. Hey, at the end of the day, I probably got swayed by his charisma. <laughs> you know, that whole like, <laughs> that yeah. stupid ass laugh that he had. But I bought it. And then I learned my lesson and I learned to never do that again. But, you know, even looking at the invocation that I delivered in Des Moines, and for your listeners that, don't, that aren't aware of that, you know, we can cover that too. But mm -hmm. I had to search for a lawmaker that would sponsor me. Because part of the requirement was you couldn't just show up and deliver it. You actually had to have a lawmaker like say, yep, I, I am owning this. I will stand up for this and say, yep, I'm supporting it. I had to email like 10 or 20 lawmakers. And it was finally, it was finally two female lawmakers in the Iowa House, um, one of which is very LGBTQ. Uh, I, I don't know specifically if she is or identifies as it, but she is definitely an ally of that community. So I was like, fuck yeah, that's that's who I want right there. Like, hey, let me get on that bandwagon because that's awesome. And that's truly showing diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And it was actually probably, and I'm going to totally mess this age up, but I bet you she was in her late 40s, early 50s, a woman from 10 minutes south of here that said, this is the right thing to do. I'm a Democrat. This is what we're supposed to do. And she said, I will sponsor you. Let's make this happen. First atheist invocation ever in the history of Iowa. But I had to have somebody sponsor me. Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment where I kind of looked at some of the Democrats that had um, said, well, no, I'm sorry. I can't do that. And, and a le uh, I won't say by name, but there was a member of the leadership of a certain chamber that wanted to pull the whole, well, you're not in my district. Okay, wait a minute. You have the edge of history sitting in your lap. Literally, like, are you going to turn down this opportunity based on a technicality? You're going to literally look at an atheist, a person that's yeah. willing to, to put his name, his ass on the line for a movement, for himself, for what's right. And you're going to tell me that based on a technicality? Okay, so I, I do not want to say this lightly, but I have learned a lot from the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. And I will be the first to say that we do not have it as bad as the civil rights movement. No. What what African Americans went through back in, I mean, for, from the dawn of time. So I want to make sure I'm very perfectly clear there. Yeah. But, but in that, now with that said, are you seriously telling me that if Martin Luther King came to your house and said, hey, I, I need a place to stay. Hey, I need some help with this. Hey, I need, you would literally look him in the eye and say, nah, I'm good. You know, hey, you're not you're not from my county. You're not from my yeah. county, man. I can't I can't help you. I mean, it's not to be partisan, but that's such a fucking spineless response. And I'm hey, not. Just, and I'm not. Up. I mean, it could have been any party, but I'm especially not surprised that that came from a Democrat. I don't know. I just I've studied enough American political history. Pol politics is a messy business. Anybody who's idealistic about it doesn't understand it. It right. you know. Otto von Bismarck, the founder of modern Germany, the, the, the diplomat, and uh, he once said that politics is the art of the possible. And he's right, you know? And the difference was there was a generation of, of lawmakers, particularly after World War II, who were willing to put some of their own ideals aside to do what's best for the country. They, they had an, a sense of, of knowing, okay, if I get 40% out of what I of what I want out of this proposal, that's better than getting nothing. The problem right. is now we have a generation of lawmakers 
mostly of which are on the Republican side, who say, if I get 40%, that is a, that's fucking blasphemous. I either want all that I want or nothing. I don't give a shit. I'm going to get what I want. Um, my former senator, Dick Luger, who was a Republican, an amazing statesman. I didn't agree with him on everything, but he was a true statesman. On his in his invocation that he gave when he was leaving Congress, he said, he said, there are a lot of people in this chamber who who think that the mere act of holding an opinion is the same as governing. And I yeah. thought, wow, that's that's amazing. And of course, I mean, he was talking about the, the you know people like you know Ted Cruz, who is the asshole. Du jour. I mean, I mean, or or people like you know, um, you, you, people like him or Ron Johnson or whatever, and you know. But that's what I'm saying. Like the fact that 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 um, legislator stood up for you and said, "Yes, that's what we do. That's what we do as liberals. That's what we do as Democrats. We're going to do it." That's called that's a profile in courage. That is exactly what the Democratic Party should be, because. Like I said, if, if if the Democrats don't make a clear distinction between them and the Republicans, the Republicans are always going to win, and they're always going to set the narrative. They're always going to set the narrative, which I mean, you know, I I don't want to pick on a local uh, county level Democratic Party, but I I, I do want to bring this up because this is the thing that's chapping my ass. And please, and having created an atheist advocacy group, it kind of allows me to take a step back and play neutral to both sides. Mm -hmm. Which is just very, which is very odd because usually I'm very partisan and I and I like the issues that I like and I have a, a stance and I go for it. Mm -hmm. But I had the opportunity to attend a district wide meeting that was hosted by one county party that invited representatives from all the surrounding counties to it. But I went as the token atheist. Now by then. They all know me. They know me on a first name basis. They've seen my activism. They know exactly why I'm there. They were talking about party building and they were talking about messaging. And they were talking about how are we going to take back what happened, you know, after what happened, uh, to how we're going to take back all these seats. And I just sat back in the weeds and I kind of listened. And it was the same. And I don't mean to make this podcast political and, and no, no, petty, this, po this podca podcast is political and petty. Go for it. Sure, sure. <laughs> so I sat there and I listened to a wide variety of people from 20 year old females to 70 year old males from you know, blacks, whites, Hispanics, Asians. I mean, it was a wide mix. We had disabled folks. We had elderly. We had everybody. Mm -hmm. And not once did they bring up secular issues. They did not talk about owning the message. There were some that thought, we should just say we're Democrats and that's enough to win. And I went, okay, wait a minute. Is that is that the mindset going forward for the state of Iowa? I mean, is that the mindset nationally? Is that we're just going to tip our hats or, you know, put our hats on that and that's how we're going to win. And if they don't start, if, if neither party start embracing secular America slash atheist America, I just want to share a quick story. Please. After my activism in the presidential can campaign, I was contacted by American atheists and I was invited to help them with their table at CPAC. And I believe it was a year or two before that, where they had been approved a table and then the CPAC organizers found out that who they were and so they denied it and they said, nope, sorry, we can't have you here. So this was like the first time I believe that they actually had a table that wasn't gonna get kicked out, it wasn't gonna get torn down. And that was one of the best experiences that I've ever had in this whole activism experience, the whole year and a half that I, or two years that I have under my belt because at that moment I got to learn that it's both parties that are squandering this opportunity. You know, they had a diagram up that showed like, I think it was seven East Coast states where had Mitt Romney back in 2012 just appealed to those non-religious voters, he would have won the entire election. Now, I'm probably misquoting that. I probably don't have the facts right. But I just remember there being a couple of the states highlighted and it said in 2012, had Mitt Romney gotten off the religious kick? Had he kind of just taken a step back from it and said, I want all voters, not just the religious ones. I want all voters. He would have won that thing. Had he been the modern Republican, he really is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. So with that said, I mean, to think that there are 60 going on 80 million voters in this country that don't believe in a deity, 
don't want to hear your religious bullshit, don't want to hear God bless America, God bless your state, and they just want to talk about issues and they want to be welcomed into a party. Yeah. You know, I don't mind. I'll debut my next effort on this show. How about that? How's that for Please, a absolutely. <laughs> this is a Reason my, Revolution scoop, breaking news. That, that's right, breaking news. Do you have that sounder button yet? Yeah, yeah. I got, I'll put it in in post. I got like a transition sound that I no, use. I want to hear things. you. I want to hear you do it. Oh, I like, hear you make. Well, I mean, the sound that I have kind of goes like, it's like, whew, like it sounds like that, but, yep. but we can do like, RKO radio with some breaking news coming out of Los Angeles. You know, you yep. um, yeah, go ahead. So it's not been huge, but I think it's something for atheists that are sitting out there going, how do I get involved? I'm kind of on the fence about being public with this. What I plan on doing is I plan on sending out surveys to candidates that are going to be running for office. I'm going to be sending out surveys to elected officials that are currently holding a position. But I also want to talk to the heads of county parties because they're really at, at the really the grassroots level of state politics. And they are the ones that have somewhat of the most impact on those voters because once a month, they meet up in coffee shops and restaurants and all these things. I want to find out what role does religion play in their county parties? What role does religion play in the way they vote? Do they know an atheist? Have they ever met an atheist? What do they even think atheism means? I mean, this is going to be a very tricky effort, and it's not the most, you know, I'm sure other secular groups out there have tried this and done it very, very well. But I think the difference with me is if I don't get an answer, I'm going, to sh I'm going to start showing up to these meetings and I'm going to start rocking the atheist gear and I'm going to start saying, where's the accountability? You know, I attended a legislative forum recently where they did a prayer at the start of the meeting and I blasted them on Twitter. I said, is this your way of attracting new voters? I said, do you understand the way you're pushing away secular voters that don't want to hear this at the start of a town hall meeting? And to my dismay, the Twitter account basically laughed at me and scoffed at it and said, we've been doing it for years and we don't plan on stopping. And I said, well, sorry to break it to you, but guess what? Like the county you represent, probably almost 60% of it is non-religious. So it's kind of like, hey, if you want to lay in that bed, you want to go and make that bed and lay in it, go right ahead. But we are on the outside trying to say, listen, Embrace us. Talk about us. Use the word atheist in your campaign rallies. Talk about being non-religious. Don't pander to the religious anymore. And I understand that it's probably part of what their strategists tell them. Like, hey, oh, you're yeah. going into a very you're going into a very religious town. Make sure we talk about you know Jesus and let's mention it a couple times. And so anyway, no, I, that's just, that's fantastic. It's something that's so small that mm -hmm. the novice activist could do and you Hell, intend to do on. this well oh, i'm sorry no i was just gonna say go out and make a fake gmail account <laughs> you know you don't have to put your name on it just yeah so do you intend to do this with like um because one one thing that one criticism i have of the democrats especially is they don't give a shit about local elections um they're starting to change that uh but for for a long time they just haven't given a fuck about them is the surveys that are the surveys you're going to do are they going to be sort of tailored to, you know, like uh, uh, like a county, like a county council or a city council or um, a, a state legislator? Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping not to get too big with this because, you know, I only have so much help in my group. But yeah. I, I want to do this for every single person that's a member of any level of government. That's awesome. Because the, the power in it isn't the fact that you created it or you put it in front of them. But if you start, you know, when you send your email out to them, and this is just, you know, PR 101, copy the newspaper, copy the TV station, you know, and then when they fail to respond, I hate, I, I despise that I'm about to say this, so bear with me as a liberal, but I really want to borrow the NRA's tactics about it. No, they no, have, no, they're, they're brilliant. They, they have a specific paragraph at the start of their, their uh, survey that says flat out, if you do not answer these questions or you do not respond to us, we will take that as a refusal to fill this out. And we will let your voters know and we will let your constituents know that you refuse to answer this. And my thinking is 
you know what? I'm past worrying about what residents of some town in BFE, Iowa, think about me and my activism. I mean, every time I accomplish something, you should see the comment section on Facebook. Oh, my God. I bet you it's crazy. Oh, people just rip me. I mean, what does he care? And if he doesn't care about God, why does he care so much? But it's like, but it's like, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm out here to prove a point. And sometimes getting them not to answer is better than any bullshit that they could have spewed at me. Oh, absolutely. Sometimes getting the media to jump on the fact that we've emailed a mayor eight times about something and they refuse to talk to us. That's exactly what happened in the city of Waverly, Iowa. When I was able, I was successful in getting them to change their prayer practice. I found out that the guy doesn't really use, the mayor doesn't really use email. So after a few emails and he, after a few phone calls, when he didn't answer me, I just started showing up to city council meetings. That's fantastic. And after a, after a while, he had no choice. I mean, he had to respond because we got it out to the, the local media. We got it out to the atheist media. Huge props to him at Meta at the Friendly Atheist. Oh, because yeah. When he puts something out there, this atheist movement hears about it. They know about it. They know the ins, the outs, what's at stake where the person being challenged should mm-hmm. stand. So for example, the mayor, I, I just love when Hemet finishes his stories by saying, you know what? Just, I think in the last one he wrote was something like Justin respectfully laid out what could happen. Now it's up to the mayor to figure this out and do the right thing. And my thinking is if a city clerk hears about that story and says, holy shit, Hemet, who's this, who's this Hemet dude? And he's got half a million followers on Facebook <laughs> and this, and this story's out there now. Yeah. I mean, we had another city independence, Iowa, which is about an hour away from Waverly where the mayor refused to even acknowledge our day of reason request email. And so we showed up to a city council meeting and I recorded some residents calling her out for it. And she got pissed at the way Hemet described her and the guy sitting beside her. So, I mean, if she's hearing about a blog in the atheist world about something she did as mayor, this activism works. This getting up and challenging these these people, it works. And I don't want to just jump to the gun and say, oh, they're all assholes. No, I think they are byproducts of very bad ideas. They are byproducts of a society that has said, if you you must be religious to be a good person. Mm-hmm. And if you're not religious, you're some kind of fucking demon that needs to be locked in a cage and, and you know, thrown off a cliff. But or if you don't out, believe in you know, some version of Jesus, you're unelectable, which is the other one. Exactly. And even on the local level, the, the mayor and independence, and now I'm rambling, so bear with me. But no, the mayor fine. We did some creeping on her campaign Facebook page, which was still active. She had the audacity to basically say, you know, my number one priority, I want to represent all all residents of the city, but something to the effect of, uh, but my main priority is to is to love and praise Jesus. So she says something about, I'm all about separation of church and state, but I love my Jesus. And it's like, Wow, could you dog whistle any louder to your religious friends about what kind of mayor you intend to be? Oh, well, shit. I mean, you know, my former governor, now vice president, Mike Pence, he gave so many fucking speeches in his fucking career where he'd go, I'm a Christian, I'm a conservative, and I'm a Republican in that order. And he'd always say it that way. I even saw him do it in person. Um, Working at the Statehouse, I got to meet him. One, he's very short. Two, (laughs) two. He shakes hands in a creepy way. Uh, he does like the whole handshake and then grab the arm thing, like the arm pinch. I don't know if you've ever had that from a politician, but it's the handshake with the arm pinch. Um, uh, but but you know he used to say that all the time, and I for, and I thought to myself, I don't care that you're a Christian, I really don't care that you're a conservative, and I really don't care that you're a Republican. But that was what it was. This was all virtue signaling. Like, that's all it was. So for people who identify with that, they just go, oh, he's talking about people like me. And it's not like liberals don't do that either. When someone says, you know, I'm a, you know, when, when someone says, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a liberal Democrat or I'm a progressive or I'm a, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm non non non-binary gender queer. What? Yeah. A Bernie crap. A Bernie crap or, you know, I'm a 
You know, I'm an, like I said, like I'm a non-binary genderqueer activist or whatever. That's also moral signaling. You're, you're explaining to people your perspective. Um, but, but the difference between some of the more activists that I was just describing in Pence is that, first off, Pence is a shameless, opportunistic son of a bitch, which is the other part of it. Um, and, and, you know, who, who, and just to give you, just to give you some context, one, he didn't really do all that much when he was governor other than piss people off and, and fuck up our roads. And two, um, uh, I-69, which goes through our state, has been under construction for years because they couldn't get, because he, he, him and the, the uh, legislator Republicans who have been in super majorities for years here in Indiana couldn't get their shit together on it until they finally did, which was raising the gas tax, um, which I'm fine with. I mean, you know, by all means, I remember there was a time when being conservative meant you did spend government money, but you made sure you paid for it. Um, yeah. Instead of, you know, tax cutting to all hell and then running deficits, which is what they like to do now. Um, but, you know, I had a point with this. Oh, my, <laughs> my, main, my main point was just the fact that, like, you know, it's fine that you're a Christian. It's fine you're a conservative Republican. Great. Fine. Whatever. It doesn't tell me anything about what you're going to do yeah. as, as, a, as a person, as, as a leader, as a public servant. What are you going to do? And And, you know, and that was the thing. I mean... And, and Pence did that. I mean, he pandered to the religious people. I mean, you probably remember the whole Riffer thing that blew up two years ago. I remember Actually, that. Let, let me jump in there. Please. That was, that was one of my first pieces of atheist activism. Even though I didn't do it from an atheist perspective, what inspired me was because I was like, well, fuck this. I'm an atheist. I should write on this. Um, it was when he had passed the Riffer law. Mm -hmm. um, there was this idea that all these businesses in Indiana – we're going to leave. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm a small business owner. I said, well, shit, this is perfect. So I wrote an open letter to his office and I said, Hey, like you can send all the businesses our way. If you're going to be a douche about it, like, because my big thing is with the whole cake baking for gays, I'm a photographer. I want gay weddings. I want lesbian weddings. I yeah. want, you know, I want all of them. Um, not just from an opportunistic capitalist standpoint, but from a moral standpoint, mm -hmm. they deserve, they deserve that experience too. And they deserve high quality photos as well. Um, so I wrote this letter and I jumped onto Twitter. And if you remember the old show, Roseanne from the nineties, yep. I got, uh, Tom Arnold to endorse the letter. Oh, nice. Uh, I, hit, I hit him up on Twitter and I said, Hey, you're a fellow Iowan. I said, did you get a load of this bullshit that's going on in Indiana? And he's like, hell yeah, I did. And so, you know, it's, we kind of made news and the Des Moines Register, Iowa's largest newspaper, they wrote a big story about me and said, Iowa dad trying to lure business from Indiana. And I thought, you know what? In a small way, I kind of affected that. I don't think I changed anything, but you know what? I made an impact. So I, and uh, that's amazing. Go, what I can go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to finish with going back to what you said about Pence always wanting to say that he was a Christian. I recently experienced that with Chuck Grassley. Oh, he was happy. He was having town halls. And oh, I his town halls have been that. hilarious. I've been yeah, watching yeah, yeah. some of the it clips. Was actually, it was actually in a courthouse inside, uh, yeah, inside the courthouse. In, I think it was in Charles City or Clear Lake. I think it was Charles City. So it was this tiny little room. You had to sit in these tiny little pews almost is what they felt like. And I said, Mr. Grassley, I'm an atheist and I have a question for you. And I think I asked him about the Johnson Amendment. And I... Because I had said I'm an atheist at the start, his response was, well, now that you told me what you believe in, can I tell you what I believe in? Oh. And I'll tell you what, in that moment, I think the Iowa nice in me was like, sure, I don't give a shit. As long as you answer my question, I don't give a shit what you tell me you believe in. But, and, and rightfully so, I took a beating by atheist activists out there and, and one of them had specifically said, man, if I were in your shoes, I would have cut his ass off and said, no, I don't give two shits what you believe, because how does that affect your ability to do your job? It doesn't. And so, you know what? Here's the other thing to aspiring activists or activists that are on the fence out there. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have moments of opportunity that, are, that you're going to miss, that you're going to be kicking yourself when you get home and you're going to say, oh, my goodness. I am going to mess this up and people are going to hate me and they're going to say you're, you're a waste and whatever. But you know what I tell them? Look at all the atheist activists sitting on their ass being internet warriors. 
Look at all the atheists wanting to be Facebook meme warriors. You know, imagine the movie Braveheart if all of William Wallace's troops would have said, no, I'll just sit on Facebook and talk shit about him. You know, like I know I used to work for one. So what, uh, <laughs> what would what would they, how would they have accomplished shit if that would have been the approach? Well, so, yeah, I agree. There's people that want to rail against David Silverman, and I and I'll be honest, I'm very Team Dave. I love oh, his too. approach, but I understand there are situations where you have to be a little bit cooler, and and I feel like, like I said, he goes into situations knowing which Dave he has to be. Oh, for but sure. With, but with that said. If you're going to criticize Dave, let me see what you've accomplished. Absolutely. Plus, I mean, the, the thing, I mean, the thing about Dave, I mean, cause I loved his book, um, fighting God, which was an unbelievable read. And, and what I can tell you is there's a section in the book where he talks about something called the Overton window. Yep. Love it. And, absolutely. and he's absolutely right. Which in the sense he goes, you know, if you go up to somebody and you tell them I am a secularist, they're going to have no fucking idea what you're talking about. If you go up to somebody and go, I'm a secular humanist, maybe two people, if you're fucking lucky, knows what that is. If you yeah. go in a room and say, I am an atheist, everybody knows what that is, which is why I've never hid behind the name. And, and, and it's because, you know, he makes a great point in the book. He goes, people know what an atheist is. If you look at Google searches, people know what an atheist is. And when I go out and I say things about atheism, there are more searches about that than there are anything else. And he goes, yep. if I say this more and more and more and more and more, it's going to make it easier for people who aren't as strident as me to make a, their voice heard because the Overton window will move in our direction. He's right. This movement needs firebrands and diplomats. I sort of see myself as being a little bit in the middle on that. You know, I love Dave because Dave... Even though he is very strident, he is the firebrand, um, he is one of the most compassionate people because he under because he gets it. Like he's not, he's for lack of a better way of saying, it, he's like he's the true believer. Like he's not somebody who's trying to hedge or trying to like be a weasel about it, like some Christians do when they try to do shit in government where they're weaselly about it and they say one thing and do another. He's he fucking owns what he is and he does it. And Dave's it, the type of guy, the way I think about it is if mm -hmm. Dave was running for any kind of office, he's the type that would be willing to lose an election by holding firm to what he believes. Yes. As ironic as that sounds, as ironic as that sounds. But, you know, that first night at CPAC, we went out to supper. It was me, him, and a couple other uh, folks at American Atheist. It was a side of him that I had never seen. I mean, you don't, you don't see that side of him. And when you're sitting you know, a foot away from him having dinner, you're like, okay, so when's that asshole show up? And it never happened because that's not who he is. I mean, nope. but he gets it too. Like he knows, exactly. like he knows when he goes on, when he used to go on Bill O'Reilly, like he's like, this is, this is a performance. I am yep. giving a performance right now. And yep. I have to be on the same level that Bill is. And if I'm not, yep then I don't win. I don't do very well. Like he understands the format. He understands it's a dance and he gets that yep. part. And that's the did, thing. I was just going to ask, did you see the Samantha B uh, episode on the CPAC event? Yeah. <laughs> and there's a, there's a shot of Dave where somebody makes a comment about, Oh, I believe in this. And then he says, Oh, I'm sorry. You believe in made up crap or something to that extent. <laughs> and of course, if you're some Joe Schmo out in Idaho that's never heard of Dave and you're you're sitting there with kind of a preconceived notion of how atheists are, you're probably sitting there going, yeah, yeah, see, see, that confirms everything I think about you. But when you really hear him talk, mm -hmm. he is so well versed in all of this. Yes. I mean, and the thing did, Dave, if you're listening, remind me, how much did you pay us for this segment? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> thanks, Dave. Um, no, what I was going to say too is like Dave gets the part about politics that a lot of people don't, which is that politics is, it's both an art and a science. It's a science in the sense that you're using reason and critical thinking and, and knowledge to craft policy to make people's lives better and to hopefully make a better world. But there's also the arts part of it, which is speech making and the emotional side of it. I, one of my favorite books I've read this year so far is The Righteous Mind 
It's by Jonathan Haidt. He's a social psychologist. And he talks about how the reason that Democrats don't do as well in elections as Republicans do sometimes is because Republicans take advantage of somebody's moral palate more than Democrats do. Democrats tend to rely heavily on thinking people are reasonable and thinking people will sort of stick to the facts and thinking people will, um, you know, hear you out on policy and sort of issues of, you know, straight equality or issues of straight freedom or whatever. But he says, no, conservatives, they have a much broader moral palette. They care about freedom. They care about equality. Yes. But they also care about tradition and the sense of the sacred. And they care about all these other things that liberals generally don't play to. And he said, you know, you know, uh, the reason that Obama was successful was because he did all of that. He understood the part of the politics that was both strategic, but also literary and emotional. He understood, for you know, a lack of way of saying it, you know, he understood the sort of the 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 the, the, the human as well as the spiritual end of how politics works. That's why he won. That's why he was so successful. Sadly, it's also the reason why I think. Um, the current president is, is, that, is that successful because he knew exactly that. He knew how to play to people's emotions. The difference was, was Obama did it in the way that like Lincoln or Martin Luther King did. Trump did it in the way that P.T. Barnum or L. Ron Hubbard would have done it to people. So it's, it's, but it's that sense of emotional intelligence that needs to come back to politics because the reason why people didn't like Hillary is, kill, is Hillary has none of that. She has no sense of emotional intelligence, no understanding of sort of the, the, the spiritual side, for lack of a better word, but, you know, sort of the, 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 the emotional, the, the, the idealism of politics. She doesn't get that, you know. Um, they always say, you know, you, 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 you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. Hillary governed in prose and intended to run the country as if it was a, you know, uh, uh, sophomore biology textbook. I mean, that's the problem. And, and so that's the other thing, too. And that's the thing I like about you is I think you understand that sense of the passion and the emotion and the sense of the, the idealism of it. Because that's what makes activism work. That's why people love Dave. Because Dave knows he, uh, he's attuned to that in a way yeah. that other people aren't. And that's exactly how we win. That's exactly how we change things. It kind of makes me think about the next, uh, it probably won't be 2020 because obviously our current president won't have much competition on his from his party, if you want to say that. Loosely. Oh, no. His, but imagine in 2024, now we're getting way out there. Yeah. But imagine if atheists, instead of going out and just asking kind of this like, what do you think about the separation of church and state? I hope we're so past that then. You know, I hope we look at it more as like, you know what? That Gorsuch pick has really fucked my life over. And your obsession with religion and your government is really driving a wedge in my happiness and my pursuit of it. And, and really speaking, I mean, the Indivisible Guide, if there are listeners out there that haven't heard this, they've probably been living under a rock because I think everybody and their cousin knows about <laughs> Indivisible. The one of the things I love what they talk about is, you know, make your, your correspondence personal. Don't just make it, I oppose this, please don't vote for it. I mean, it's very much, I, I watched a segment on the news the other night where they had like a 32-year-old he was born with some genetic condition and they had him literally laying down like in a wheelchair and he had to like talk through eye commands. And he was giving this discussion about how Medicaid is giving him the quality of life that he wants. Mm -hmm. And I mean, atheists need to figure out a way to articulate why we give a shit and not only why we give a shit, but why the, the candidate in front of us should care. It needs to be more than just, oh, this issue is important to me because it's going to cost us this much money. But, you know, hey, I don't get into your religion the way you do. Are you going to care about me? Are you going to care about what's important to me and, and to our people? I hate to say our people because, <laughs> you know, the whole idea of herding cats. I mean, creating the group that we have, it has really shown me how hard it is to get people on board on the same issues, on the same things, to get them motivated. Uh, so, yeah. 
anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no need to apologize. I agree with you, and that that echoes my sentiment about the fact that um, there needs to be there needs to be a sense of emotional intelligence within our politics that isn't there. The reason that I think that you know um, forty five was so successful is that he was able to tap into sort of a vox populi. And in a way that a politician hadn't in ages, um, and and you know he he knew and embodied the Barnum effect that that you know people like to be fooled, people enjoy a bullshitter because that's the difference. And Matt Iglesias wrote this great piece for Vox where he's talking about Trump, and he said Trump is not simply a liar. Trump is a bullshitter in chief, and he's talking about Harry Frankfurt's book on bullshit. And he said the difference between the liar and the bullshitter is the liar actively diverts away from the truth in order to get something. So a liar will say something that is diametrically opposed to the truth, but at least the person lying knows what the truth is and is trying to fit their lie within the context of reality. Whereas a bullshitter just says whatever the fuck they want, doesn't really care about the consequences of it. And Trump, oh fuck, I did it, I did it, I said his fucking name, damn it. Um, um, uh, but you know, uh, he who shall not be named, um, Voldemort, whatever. Um, there you go. There you go. Uh, he was able to tap into it because he used that type of, of politics to his advantage. Because if you looked at the people who ran against him, Ted Cru the, the main people who ran against him, Ted Cruz, uh, you know, Marco, Marco Rubio, yep. uh, Jeb Bush, all of these guys were, they were literally like, if you were designing a presidential candidate action figure that had pre-programmed phrases that they could say and you push their like tummy or their back that's who they were jeb especially that i mean one of the funniest fucking things i've ever seen in my life was him doing that rally where he's he was like giving this like go hung speech and fucking crickets and he just goes please clap yeah. and it's the funniest yeah. fucking thing and like literally within the same week you know uh you know he, him, him could have, you know, fucking a multi-thousand people rallies, you know, it's like, but again, it's because he could tap into that sense of emotional, uh, intelligence that, that, that politicians used to have a sense of like, you know, Ronald Reagan was a genius at this. Um, you know, Lyndon Johnson was a genius at this. Um, and, 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 you know, this, the politicians who aren't very successful are the ones who don't really get that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's just, you know, when, when I think back to the 2016 election, I, I draw this weird comparison and help me hash this out. Yeah. Tell me if I'm on the right, tell me if I'm on the right path here. Go for it. It was basically, I want to make sure I don't offend all the, uh, comic book folks out there, but mm -hmm. essentially to, to me, it was the dark night. And here, oh, yeah. here's, here's, here's my comparison you have gotham which represents the united states it's in shambles it has all these issues going on and you have this kind of if i remember correctly wasn't it the commissioner that was not being trusted or people couldn't count on him the way that that they had hoped and i think people thought that that was obama you know here's this guy who has earned this position but now we're kind of losing faith in him I never did. I, I could have I never did him. either. I, I could have voted for him for a third time. But let's just be honest, heading into 2016, that was the narrative that people were going to try to play off of as well. He's a failed president. And then, hear me out. I, I hope I take some flack for this. Mm -hmm. Hillary was Batman. Oh, no, I because, think you're right. Because you have this individual who is seen as this hero, this predestined hero that's going to come in very emotionless, very robotic, just ghost. And, and don't get me wrong, I am a huge Batman fan. Like I love Batman. How uh, in the in the rage fulfilled moments where that rage comes out, and he's almost like the anti hero where he doesn't want to save the world. He just wants to kick everybody's ass. Mm -hmm. But there's a part of Batman that's very robotic, that that is unemotional, that is not connected with the people that he saves and the people that he helps. And he's a detective, and, right? He's constantly trying to put puzzle pieces together and, and try right. to figure out how things work. And that's what she is, too. And in a way, I kind of thought about the whole, like, Batman doesn't let people get close to him. And it didn't hit me, honestly, uh -huh. until until my kids and I watched Lego Batman. 
Because they made that Batman, if you've ever seen it, uh-uh, they, I made, haven't. they made that version of Batman so cartoonish, he still talks like this, and it's still very much like, I'm over here, and you can leave me alone. He ends up adopting adopting Robin from a from an orphanage, but he uh-huh. doesn't really he doesn't actually openly adopt him. It kind of just happens. Mm-hmm. But in the in the movie, he has such trouble trying to connect with Robin, and so I think Hillary was very much the same way. Like, yeah, she had the core group of supporters, but she didn't have the people that were just fawning over her. Like, oh, you're the greatest thing. And along comes the, you know. The I don't know what you want to call it, but just like the agent of chaos, the Joker. <laughs> yeah. You have a you have a character that doesn't give a fuck about the way things should be, ought to be, have been. Mm-hmm. Come comes in and looks Batman in the face and says, "I'm not scared of you. I don't fucking care about anything you have to say." And actually, in a weird way, if you go back and watch Dark Knight again with that under that context, yeah, you actually start to kind of feel bad for Joker. Like, here's this character who's a little bit out there, but you kind of resonate with him because, in a way, everybody feels like they're the outsider in some respect. Mm-hmm. And honestly, for me, that's what I think. I don't even. I can't even comprehend it. Here, you have a guy who lies about everything. And then goes on a campaign trail telling Iowa voters, I'm going to land at your your state fair in a helicopter. Like during the Iowa caucus, the summer of the Iowa caucus saying, I'm going to, I'm going to show up in a helicopter just to one-up everybody else. I'm going to rock a $10,000 suit while I'm here. But think of me as the common man. Think of me as your buddy down the, you know, that works in the, in the coal. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that's the remarkable shit? thing. That's what I can't understand, and that's why I truly do believe in the horseshoe idea where Bernie and and that guy, I just about said it. I caught myself. There you go. But Bernie and that guy were very, very close to each other, but they were on opposite ends of like the whole ideology and yes. morality. So you're right. So let me uh, – I'll uh, I totally agree with you. I thought you were going to go somewhere completely different with your analogy. Let's hear it. Um, Let me hear it. Because I – my analogy is – one of my all-time favorite books, and I don't know if I got it here. Pull it. It's this book here. It's called It's called Before the Storm, and it's Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of the American Consensus. It's by Rick Perlstein. He has written a three-volume history of the rise of modern American conservatism. His first book was on Goldwater, his second book is on Nixon, and his third book has been on Reagan. The 1964 election is the only election I can think of in modern memory that's that's anywhere near close to the election we just had. But imagine the 1964 election was very similar to the one we just went through, but instead of the person who did end up winning won, Hillary would win, and not only would win, but would win in one of the greatest electoral landslides in American history. So 1964 is the year that Lyndon Johnson's running for re-election. It's about... A year, I mean, Kennedy had been dead less than a year when the, ele- when the election of 1964 started. And at the time, the Republican Party was basically the party of, at the time, this is crazy when you think about it now, but it was the party of, of New England. It was the party of the patrician New England intellectual cast of politicians and, and thinkers who controlled the party. And so the people they were sort of throwing around who might run in the 1964 election were people like Richard Nixon again, who at the time was conservative but often seen as sort of a moderate Republican. In fact, when he ran in 1960 against John F. Kennedy, he wanted to have a civil rights plank in the Republican Party platform that was not just more robust than the Democratic platform, but 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 even, I mean, not just the same as the Democratic platform, but more than the Democratic platform. And that's Richard Nixon. Cut to 64, they're talking names like people like George Romney, who was Mitt Romney's dad. Um, who was the governor of Michigan. They're talking about a guy named William Scranton, who was the governor of Pennsylvania, who was another moderate Republican. And of course, the one that people probably know the most by name, Nelson Rockefeller, who was a moderate Republican. And all these guys were sort of jockeying for power. 
But out of nowhere, out of completely fucking nowhere, comes this obscure Arizona senator named Barry Goldwater. And the conservative base, and I'm not just talking the conservative base, the rabid conservative base. Like back then, you know how we have like Alex Jones people today? Back then there was a group of people called the John Birch Society, and they were very similar to that. Um, and there was the Young Americans for Freedom and all of these like very conservative groups that were backed by corporate money. Sound familiar? <laughs> um, uh, and all of them basically led an effort over f basically 10 years to get Barry Goldwater elected president. Um, this obscure Arizona senator who said crazy fucking things, was against the 1964 Civil Rights Act, was was – not a racist, but basically believed in like states' rights and was very, very conservative. But he also was a very staunch cold warrior and everything like that. His politics did not fit into the normal mold of the Republican Party. But he and his team basically took the Republican Party from being the sort of middle of the road, led by people like Eisenhower and Nelson Rockefeller in the 50s and early 60s, and made it the rabid right-wing conservative party that it is today. They completely ripped it apart. Now, here's another fun part of that story. When Goldwater becomes the nominee, the, the, he fires his campaign manager, sounds familiar, hires somebody from within who has very little experience on the campaign and surrounds himself with people from Arizona who are basically his sycophants. Also sounds familiar. Um, he made all of these horrible election decisions that, that were just bad, bad on every level in terms of messaging, in terms of how he spoke to people. Um, uh, Goldwater was known for being kind of a dick. Um, and, and, um, but at the end of the day, when the results came in in November of 1964, Lyndon Johnson won in a fucking landslide. I mean, he won like 42 states. He won like 500 some odd electoral votes. He won a huge majority of the popular vote. And Goldwater basically got resigned to the obs obscurest of history as sort of this conservative hero. Cut to 2016, the, the president now is the embodiment of what that was then. It's just worse. But, mm -hmm. you know, and so what I tell people is, imagine in the 1964 election that the very popular, fairly well-liked Democratic candidate who everybody thought was going to win ended up didn't winning. And this crazy-ass senator from Arizona became president, who's a fucking loose cannon. Nobody knows what he's going to do in the Cold War. Will he shoot nukes off to the Russians? We don't have a fucking clue. He's thought about it. He's even said it. So that's the craziness of it all is there's the Republican Party has been this nuts for this long. And that's the thing. Like people, people think of like, this is all about Reagan and this. No, 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 no. This goes way back. And so, you know, I think, I think your analogy to the Dark Knight is great because I totally didn't think you were going to say that um, yeah. <laughs> because I'm such a dork and you know, I love history and obviously that's my profession. So, but I read before the storm while the election was going on. And so I would read stories about Goldwater and his campaign and they would eerily parallel whatever, you know, 45 sure. would do. And I was like, this is fucking nuts. And so at first I'm like, he's not going to win. He's not going to win. And then he did. And I went, holy shit, this is, we're living in alternative history right now where Barry Goldwater won the White House. <laughs> but, um, it, it's, it's, yeah, I didn't know that story. And, and, Boy, I could be a fly on the wall inside your brain because holy <laughs> crap, you probably you probably forget more about history than I'll ever know. So that was <laughs> that was. I may just start tuning into your podcast just to, you know, get smarter. I mean, oh, you thank should call you. It the, you should call it the Get Smarter Podcast. You know? <laughs> thank you. I mean, <laughs> no, it's that's, just, that's awesome. I just have the bigger I, picture of it, you know. Then that's and I think of it as sort of parallels that like. He, he is the logical consequence of 50 years of this conservative coup that has happened within the Republican Party. The party of Lincoln, the party of Teddy Roosevelt and progressivism, the party of Eisenhower is now the party of, of people like Mitch McConnell and Ted Cruz and, you know, and Paul Ryan and these like spineless, you know, social Darwinistic fuckers who are just so devoid of any sort of compassion for people or any sense of like understanding what it's like to be a regular fucking person. And that's the so, thing. It's crazy. 
All right, that was the first half of my interview with Justin Scott. Part two will debut tomorrow on Saturday, and we will continue our conversation then. As always, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at The Daily Clark. And you can send us an email at reasonrevolutionpodcast at gmail.com. Until tomorrow, this is Justin Clark, and this is Reason Revolution. Revolution.